it's a 12 page mansplaining about why. <laughs> I'm like, what is happening here? Like the most elaborate, like, well, if she wouldn't have been so, you know, gentleman persuasive, <laughs> you know, this is, she, she ruined my life. Uh. Today's Movie Verdicts episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search specializes in helping small law firms in Texas hire lawyers and build great teams. So if you're a Hamilton looking for your Lafayette or a Jefferson looking for your Madison, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Before we hop in here, we are about to share with you part two of our Hamilton deep dive. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, it's in the feed. Go back, listen to that first, because when we start here, we're going to jump right back into the conversation where we left off. So don't want you to kind of have that abrupt entrance if you haven't listened to part one yet. So go back, listen to part one, then listen to part two, and uh, you'll be all set. They say George Washington's yielding his power and stepping away. Is that true? I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. It's time for part two of Hamilton. Hey, Dan, I saw that one of the uh, points on your outline was whether we not whether or not we think that or what do we think of Hamilton's advice to Philip about the duel? Oh, on the duel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The advice he gave, which was which is a thing, which is a, a kind of a gentleman's way to um i didn't mention that in the dual rules but uh that's uh essentially uh throwing away your shot your first shot by firing it into the air right um was a way to de-escalate and um try to end it and so and it normally and oftentimes did end it right there um as a way to reconcile and end it but uh yeah obviously he gave that advice to, to philip and um it didn't work um which i'm sure was something he had to live with um, whether that was the right thing to say or not. Um, and then he obviously tried it, uh, or I guess it's debated yeah, <laughs> as to where his shot was fired, um, Alexander's uh, right. at Burr, um, or not. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. What do you think on uh, the advice to his son? You know, I I, I struggle with this because one of the, the themes that is so brilliant about this performance is – I'm not going to throw away my shot. A thousand percent. And those are linked for sure. And, you know, and he teaches his son to resolve this particular duel by throwing away his shot. He sees that his son dies. And at the, at the end, Hamilton decides that he's going to throw away his shot. And it kind of begs a question. What was all that about if you were saying, I'm not going to throw away my shot and then you do it anyway? Or is the message, you know, something deeper that he he figured out in his maturity how the world works and, and how things should be? And so he wasn't he was throwing away his literal shot, but he was doing the right thing. Or he was stepping up to 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 be the man that he he wanted to be. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's definitely an arc to Hamilton's you know approach in the sense of yeah, when he's just coming into the harbor of New York from you know uh, the hurricane ravaged you know tough background and all that, then he's you know he's you know definitely in one mindset and one mode. Um, and then there is a place where, um, and I'm going to mix up now kind of the chronology of this, um, uh, with the Philip duel as well as what I'm about to say, but, um, so I don't know where it falls on his arc, but, um, where he says something to Burr along the lines of like, 
I'm taking your approach here. I'm mm. smiling more and talking less or talking less, smiling more. I can't remember even what the context was of what he, he but he says that to Burr like somewhere in the second act um, as they're getting the government together or whatever. I can't remember, but um, to get his plan on the Congress floor. Mm. Is that, is that yeah, what it was? Okay. Yeah, the yeah. Financial. Okay. So, so he's, Federal yeah. So, so there's that. So he, you're, there's definitely this, you know, embrace of at least in certain situations, Burr's method is, a viable one and it makes sense. I can't just kind of, you know, get everything I want without, you know, um, but just because I, 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 I write it or I work hard at it or whatever, I have to do some of these other things that, that maybe Burr's better at, um, kind of thing. So, yeah, I think that plays into, um, again, I can't remember where the Philip, uh, duel falls in that t- continuum, but for sure, by the time it's at the end and Hamilton is in his own duel, I think that's definitely part of it. Well, and essentially, I mean, the Reynolds pamphlet, he threw away his shot at being president by his choices. You know what I'm saying? Like there's these, um, it's like a progression of, you know, and, and I think there's a thread of it through the film that where you talk about words matter. And um, in my head, I'm thinking of like, in the founding of a country, you have um, this constitution and then these, you know, amendments and the ratification process um, that happened where words matter so much to the point that here we are hundreds of years later in courtrooms defending specific words because they were chosen for a reason. There's an intent behind the words selected and the words that are chosen for um certain amendments are there's there's a time and a place and a space behind those um and the interpretation of those even now but then this oh it's so hard to to link it together because it gets heavy because you've got you have this space where words matter and hamilton obviously that's his gift that's his sword um but then at the same time, he's this young guy and he's like, this is, I'm going to just say what I need to say and I'm going to be brash. And I'm going to be, and they're constantly like Jefferson and Burr are constantly complaining that, you know, he's out there screaming and whatever and making a fool of himself and what, you know, trying to be somebody. And, um, there's just so many lines where it comes there. There's a time and a place where not throwing away your shot means, screaming at the top of your lungs and calling people out and there's a and then there's space for that growth and the and for him to say based on wisdom and what he's lived and what he's seen to say and just the love of his son wanting to protect his son and saying okay you know this is when you shoot to the sky and you know are is he throwing away a shot essentially by doing that or the choices that he's making by saying well i'm gonna sleep with this lady for an entire year and expect to still, you know, when it comes out to still be president, you know, like the, the choices that you make, um, can throw your shot away for you, whether you like it or not. Um, which kind of goes to the whole thread of like, you know, who we don't get to decide who lives and who dies and who tells your, you know, who's going to tell your story kind of deal. All right. I'm just going to briefly mention a client moment because I thought it was neat um, how Hamilton, uh, so this is our best client moment, um, where Hamilton is uh, trying to draft Burr into helping him write the Federalist Papers. Mm. And he basically calls the Constitution the most important client, you know, or whatever. Like he, That's how he refers to the Constitution as his client. Like this is the most important client, this most important case, whatever. I need your help, Burr. You're a better lawyer than me which is interesting to hear him say that. Hmm. Um, and will you help me write this? And, uh, you know, in the actual history, I did not, I, it didn't look like that actually had happened. That was more just uh, some license creatively to create some more um, places where Burr and Hamilton contrasted in their approach, I think. Um, so I'm not sure Burr was actually ever approached to, to write those. Didn't look like it from the research I did. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Hamilton and Madison and uh, uh, predominantly plus uh, a few from Jay write the Federalist Papers, which are um, still in a very important part of political philosophy. And, and, um, and so, uh, but I thought that was a great client moment that the constitution is the client. Hmm. We need to go out and defend it. And 
That was pretty cool. Yeah. The uh, best scene or best song of yeah. the of the movie. I know this is gonna be really? tough. Really? Are we really gonna? Do- we're gonna. We're gonna. We're you know. You we're gonna gotta pick one. You don't have to pick one. Um, it just depends on the day. You know, I'll, right. I'll, I'll 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 go through a few uh, that stand out to me um, today, anyway, or when I made these notes. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure there are ones that you guys like too that uh, we should highlight. So, um, you know, I think the, the first song is um, is great. I think it's it's one of the best songs. It's the anchor for the whole show. I, it's incredible, really, that in one song that's maybe four or five minutes long, you get essentially the entire Hamilton origin story crammed into uh, that short amount of time. Um, and it's it sets up the rest of the show. It does The rest of the show is based upon that kind of building block. And so I thought that was um, awesome. Um, and then My Shot is probably the most beloved of all the songs, I would say, popularly. And, and I think it's great. Um, the things I want to mention from My Shot, um, we've already talked about some of them, um, is some of the influences that Miranda used, uh, which I, I think are great. Um, I was laughing earlier about using the B-R-O-O-K-L-Y thing on uh, like he does with Alexander Hamilton, which actually is Notorious B-I-G again. Um, and uh, in going back to Cali. Uh, from the nineties, which a lot of his influences are hip hop and rap and, uh, from the nineties. Um, and, uh, it's like that. He also, um, in an interview was talking about how the, um, he uses the AOL login noise Mm -hmm. from old school dial up internet is the inspiration behind the, whoa, 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 whoa. Like that, that tracks with like, crazy. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> and like, yeah, that's yeah. where he tracked that with crazy. I mean, just that yeah. stuff. So cool. I love that. Um, and then just him and he talks about this in another interview as well. Like how he went in that, my shot song when he's, you know, the, uh, other characters are kind of just doing their, uh, kind of normal pace of, uh, words to the tempo. Like one of his big, um, pieces to make Hamilton's brilliance shine was to essentially, you know, speed up the tempo by two in order Mm -hmm. to show his intellect. And so he was making sure that Hamilton's rhymes were like essentially twice as fast as the other characters, um, as a way to highlight that. Um, and then the other piece about my shot is that it really permeates the whole show because in addition to what we talked about before, several of the other songs have the same melody, as that song, or even have some of the same, uh, words as that song. My shot is brought back in several other songs. Um, Mm. and and so I I think that's obviously a great one. King George, all of them are great. The first one's my favorite. Um, and we should say like, there's only 10 minutes of stage time for King George and, Mm. uh, you know, uh, pound for pound. That's pretty good. 10 minutes. He gets out of that. (laughs) (laughs) He makes the most of those 10 minutes. Um, The Blow Us All Away song with the split screen of Burr and Hamilton with the kind of shadow box, like they're kind of in like, they're on the stage at the same time. It's more the the visual of that, I think, is really powerful to go along with the song. Um, Mm -hmm. Adrian knows Must Be Nice, Might Be Nice is one of my favorites. I will find myself humming that um, all the time. We were all watching. He got Washington in his pocket. It must be nice, it must be nice To have Washington on your side It must be nice, it must be nice To have Washington on your side And sometimes I'll just do it around the house with the family Must be nice to have daddy on your side <laughs> Brooklyn and then the, or Dylan in this fight <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, And you know what, we haven't talked about it yet but... Um, the one last time Washington song, um, is really, I mean, it's really phenomenal, I think. And back to kind of Washington being the anchor that the show can kind of revolve around in some ways, um, also highlights, I think one of the themes that we haven't really talked about that stands out at least for sure in the second time I watched it, which is, um, the act of setting down, uh, power, of Washington stepping away and not running again and not essentially taking a monarchy type of approach, um, Mm. to the presidency. 
I think still is probably one of the greatest gifts that any of the founding fathers gave to anyone. And, um, yeah, you know, it's just, it's remarkable to, to have, to hear some of his farewell address in that song. Um, I mean, his actual farewell address in that song. And then, um, you know, hear King George kind of mock it or be confused by it. Like, you know, I can't mm-hmm. believe that's something someone could do, or I didn't know yeah. that was something someone yeah. could do. Um, you know, that that's, you know, stepping aside, you know, shocked Hamilton, obviously in the scene there too, like, you know, basically had to convince Hamilton to write that speech for him. Um, mm. and, and all, so it's just that, that whole idea of him giving up power when he didn't, you know, really didn't have to, nobody really wanted him to either. I mean, at that point. And so just what, what a, what a tremendous act, um, that, that, that was, I, I don't know that, that stands out to me and the song's great too, but just the theme it highlights. Yeah. You know, my, my favorite is nonstop. Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Assume that attitude may be your doom. Oh, why do you write like you're running out of time? Right day and night like you're running out of time. Everything. Mm, yeah. There's just so much that's going on inside of that song and so much that's going on on the stage. And I mean, it goes from just the drive that he has to, uh, you know, why do you assume that you're the smartest in the room to history has its eyes on you to, um, you know, his conversation, um, good with Angelica. Yeah. I mean, just all those pieces perfectly weaved in and it, it just, it's, it's a great medley and it just kind of, ties everything together and brings it all together and just has so much force to it. And it, and it even, it still feels inspiring because behind all of it is, is the drive is just like, you could almost, you could almost say that that one song tells you everything that you wanted to know about Alexander Hamilton. If you didn't hear any of the other ones for sure. Um, and then I, I'll, kind of throw another twist in there referencing the mixtape there's some i mean fantastic music on there guys if you haven't heard it (laughs) it's so good um i there's there's a song um called immigrants and it is based on that one line between hamilton and lafayette where they say we have quite a run immigrants we get get the job job done." done yeah the song there's so much talent in that song but then if you go watch the music video i mean it is it takes that conversation up 10 levels and awesome. it just tur- it just turns the whole i mean it, it it's a performance in and of itself yeah uh highly recommend it adrian yeah, I ha- any I mean, other scenes or songs yeah that no up? there's a bunch um so i would say probably favorite songs would be uh, the cabinet battle, the first one yeah. where they're talking about taxation and like, you know, like, you know, when they're like, whatever, you know, look what we did when they tax our tea. Imagine when you tax our whiskey and uh, that back and forth. <laughs> Jefferson's great in that. Yeah. Well, and uh, let me see if I got it pulled up and where he says, um, you know, uh how do you not get it? If we're aggressive and competitive, the union gets a boost. You'd rather give it a sedative. And then the response is a civics lesson from a slaver. Hey neighbor, you know, your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor. And that, that raising the, it's like, Oh, you want to do this, but uh, you know, raising the bar to say, you're not, you're not doing the work. You're paying your debts aren't paid because of you. They're paid because of the backs of all the people that you're raising yourself on. So I really enjoy the back and forth of that because it's like a, it's like a slap of reality to the face. Um, and, uh, I like the dear Theodosia song with Burr and Hamilton. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you and you'll blow us all away Someday, someday Yeah, you'll blow us all away Someday, someday Oh, Philip, when you 
smile, I am undone. My son. Because in the scene, and I like I like the song in the scene, um, because you really feel the weight of and I was telling Daniel this the other day, where they're each singing to their kids. Um, but they're all it, it's almost like they're singing to the nation, you know, where it's like mm-hmm. they've they've birthed this nation, they've cut, you know, they've kind of freed themselves from tyranny of Britain and um we have a chance to do you know to kind of create a foundation for this country and um I just thought it was really brilliant um the juxtaposition of two people who um don't necessarily line up don't necessarily like one another but their desire is to create a space where their kids can grow up and have this amazing nation and the possibility like to see the weight on both of them and then to see the the possibility of like what this could happen but then also to see the side by side that you need each other like they needed each other um to to create that like you can't just have a one-sided deal and it'd be great for everybody that everybody's input is valued and that uh, it just the scene in the song um was really yeah. good and then George Washington's song I really liked um for the reasons that you mentioned but also why do I never have anything pulled up on my phone um <laughs> <laughs> was he kept referencing that he wants to sit under his own vine and it's a mm-hmm. verse in Micah yep. And I was reading the rest of the passage and it really was um, more than just that one verse that he mentions where they're talking about, um, you know, that nations, that everyone will kind of beat their swords into their plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, where it's like we stop the fighting and we start growing and nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. And for him to be singing that, first of all, his voice is butter. Like his... (laughs) His you, voice is you hung phenomenal. Up on me, Adrian. You hung up on you me. You hung up on me. Oh, no! <laughs> Let me call you back. That's okay. What I had to say wasn't important. That's what I'm getting. <laughs> no. Yo, you can still say it. You just can't hear her. So, you know. me right now. Uh, 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 let's call you back. It must be nice. It must be nice. Okay. Are you there? Okay, there we go. To have yeah, Robert yeah. on the phone. On the line. It must be nice. Must <laughs> be but nice. But no, so that was one of my other, <laughs> I would say that was a, a solid a solid scene and song combined. I agree. Where you just feel the, I love the biblical reference from a space of like, I am tired of war. I'm tired of fighting. I want to mm-hmm. I want to sit in this place where we've all found space, where everybody has a space and everybody can grow and can thrive and I want to I want to be done with this. And I feel like the work of creating a country or the work of I mean, look at kind of what you're doing right now, Robert, where you're just it's like you're exhausted. The work of, you know, fighting for what's good and what's right and what's just um, mm-hmm. so that we can live in a space where God intended us to to be is exhausting and tiring. And just to see that in his face and to hear it in his voice and the expressions, it really was beautiful. And to say, gosh, when people know, um, I feel like I listened to a podcast where somebody was saying like, I... Well, and, you know, really good actors and and bands and stuff do it all the time where it's like, I don't want to go out swinging like I want to finish in a in a good space. I want to leave everything better than when I found it. And I want to know when my time is done and when I need to hand it to the next person. Um, Anyway, it was a really Mm -hmm. good song. It is Um, one piece I wanted to pick up on from your rap battle uh, suggestion Um, because there was another uh, rap battle originally written for the production, which was the battle over slavery. 
um, that was cut. Really? Um, and I would say that is a, uh, and more recently now that it's come back into the mainstream with the release on Disney and everything else, I think one of the critiques is that the issue of slavery wasn't uh, explored enough in the show that the founding fathers were put on a pedestal throughout the entire performance without getting enough grief, I would say for, um, allowing All slavery to, well, uh, to make its way through. Owners. Yeah. Um, Lawrence brings it up obviously as his number one thing that he wanted to, to do. Um, and then you mentioned in that one battle, um, it's, used as a dig against Jefferson in the South, um, as a reason why they don't have any debts. Um, and so it's not that it's never mentioned, but it's, uh, it's certainly not highlighted and it's not elevated and, and, and all of that. So, um, you know, I think, and even I think Lynn Miranda in, in uh, response to critique has said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fair critique, <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, worthy of discussion. So, um, you know, know, for me, I feel like because the the character that played the the guy that plays John Lawrence is so uh, lovable in his performance. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and you, I mean, he doesn't. You don't get a lot of time with him. No, in the spotlight. But when the letter gets delivered from his father, and Eliza is reading it, and John Lawrence is kind of off to the the side and mm -hmm. sort of the memory of him and as you know john dreamed of emancipating and recruiting three thousand men for the first all-black military regiment his dream of freedom for these men dies with him tomorrow there'll be more of us alexander are you all right I have so much work to do. I mean, it just ooh, it just brings yeah. chills to see Alexander looking that way and hearing that that refrain. Tomorrow there'll be more of us mm -hmm. um, from the story of tonight. Yeah, it, it 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 just the the idea that in the letter says this from his father that his dream to see those men that he fought with free Freed. died with him. It just it it feels like a powerful enough statement that it speaks for the disappointment and the letdown and the hurt of the loss of that that hope of mm. of mm. freedom for for the slaves as well. Um, and it just it, it's so powerful to, to me. I just I, I love it. I love that character. I love that song. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh Best line in the movie, the Yellow Highlighter Award. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and we've already mentioned a bunch, I think. Um, uh, some of the obvious ones, Talk Less, Smile More, uh, has made its way into <laughs> memes and face masks and everything else uh, that you can get uh, now. Um, you know, a couple of Washington ones, um, you know, that are very similar, actually, that I jotted down. Dying is easy, living is harder. Um, mm -hmm. I thought, uh, as well as winning is easy, governing is harder. Um, those were kind of mm -hmm. linked together. Um, but, um, if you stand for nothing, Burr, what will you fall for? Um, was sort of a jolting first line and, um, dig at Burr that Hamilton has early on. Um, another, uh, an Eliza one that I kind of, I'll bring back to my first thematic comment about the art of words and the importance of words. Um, Eliza says in the song burn, um, you built palaces out of paragraphs. Mm -hmm. I just kind of like that. I mean, that really sums up a lot of what Hamilton's power is um, with mm -hmm. over her as a, as they courted and over Angelica as they wrote back and forth. And obviously as he founded the nation and wrote the Federalist Papers and all the writings he did for Washington. So um, that palaces out of paragraphs, I liked a lot too. I, I'm going to go for wait for it. Yeah, so that song for me, I feel like is Burr's version of my shot. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it explains his motivations. Yeah. And there's this line in there where he says, I'm not falling behind or running late. I'm not standing still. I'm lying in wait. 
Mm-hmm. And I know that it has sort of the, the imagery there. Burr's character is portrayed as a, a predator that's lying in wait for his prey. But there's something I think to be said about being a late bloomer uh, and realizing like there's, there's an opportune moment, so to speak. And, and that's when you shoot your shot. And that's the, the kind of the intersection where both Burr and Hamilton both sort of miss it. And you hear Burr lamenting that when he says, I I realize now that the world was big enough for both of us. That, 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 that's hard. That, that was hard for me to watch that last time. Um, Burr just, you could tell, just devastated. Um, and that realization, the world's big enough, was big enough for both of us. Basically, why didn't I see that? Um, and uh, yeah. Um, but the idea, though, yeah, picking your spots. Um, and and uh, you know, it, it's it's the old analogy of kind of the rifle shot versus the shotgun approach. I mean, Alexander Hamilton yes. is the shotgun and, and Burr's the rifle and there's different approaches. Um, but yeah, let's do some, uh, inadmissible evidence, uh, as we wind it up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, we could have done intermission like the, uh, play or like the, uh, musical <laughs> or the actual movie too has an intermission. Let's see. Oh, I, I was going to mention a couple of things here. So um, there is a script for the film version of this, like a kind of traditional film version of this. Um, but more recently, it Miranda mentioned that he didn't expect it to actually happen. Um, and so he, he said, he said, uh, I don't love a lot of musicals, movie musicals based on shows because it's hard to stick the landing. I don't know what the cinematic version of Hamilton looks like. If I had, I'd had written it as a movie. Um, so he didn't write the, the, the screenplay that's out there for it. Um, someone else associated with the show did, but, uh, so I don't know. That'd be interesting. Um, do you want to talk about the effect that, that this performance had on the treasury department's decision? Yeah. Yeah. Cause right at the time there was uh, momentum behind uh, replacing Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill. Um, and this show gets popular and then, uh, they switch it to the $20 bill. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was funny to go back and remember some of the things that happened like that, um, that don't necessarily come out from watching the show again. Cause you, you don't get anything about that from watching the show, but just get, kind of digging into, um, what has happened as a result of this musical over the last four years um with the ten dollar bill now becoming the twenty dollar bill um and and harriet tubman um and then also Mm. um i'd kind of forgotten about the uh speech that the cast gave to mike pence uh after they were elected and before they were in office Mm -hmm. um i went back and read the that letter that they read from the stage from the whole cast i'd kind of forgotten about that Mm -hmm. honestly um and, uh, that was interesting. Yeah. Just a, a lot of, a lot of things. Um, by the way, was that the, at the end of the performance or the beginning of the performance? It was at the, they came out after the, after. Yeah. I think it was after. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. so, you know, Burr was charged with murder, um, in New York and New Jersey, <laughs> but he wasn't tried. Um, and, uh, the New Jersey Supreme court, um, squashed his indictment. Um, and, so uh, messed up. Yeah. So Burr, um, is later then arrested and tried for treason for organizing essentially a off the grid rogue military excursion into the Louisiana territories. Um, and, uh, he was acquitted of that and then sort of was out of public life, um, after that. I've got some other stuff, Robert. What do you have? Anything? For uh, you know, the revisiting the the issue of the Treasury Department. You know, there was talk about Harriet Tubman showing up yeah. on the twenty dollar bill at one point. Yeah, and that just didn't happen. I mean, let's. 
<laughs> yeah, like that was the. <laughs> what, do, mm-hmm. what do we want to say about that? Why do we? What do we think the motivation oh, there was? I, I just, there was just... I see. Uh, yeah. I, well, I, I just uh, I, I I I see it as uh, it's going to be Harriet Tubman ah. um, at some point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm some- just still. I'm just still. I'm just. We t- we t- we took a four year pause on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 my well, thought on it. But um, yeah. yeah, I'll wait for point. it. Yeah, I no, just, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I hear you. I'm going to be an optimist on that one. I'm just. Uh, I'm assuming it's. Uh, yeah, it's just on pause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other influences on the show, uh, The West Wing, which is one of our favorites, um, was a big influence on Hamilton and Aaron Sorkin's writing. Who also wrote one of our other podcast uh, uh, topics, uh, A Few Good Men, um, of course. Um, but uh, there are several different places. Um, like in the Skylar Sisters song, Angelica sings, uh, I'm looking for a mind at work. Um, I'm looking for a mind at work. And that was a, a line that was given to uh, Rob Lowe's character, Sam Seaborn, um, when he's talking about what he looks for in a presidential candidate. He wants to see a mind at work. Mm. It's one of the first things he looks for. Um, we watched this episode last night. Yeah. The one with Ellie, um, where uh, Bartlett tells his daughter, Ellie. Um, the only thing you ever had to do to make me happy was come home at the end of the day. All you had to do to make me happy was come home at the end of the day. And Eliza sings that. Um, and uh, that would be enough. So long as you come home at the end of the day, that would be enough. Um, that came from there as well. Um, and so I, I like those West Wing references. Um, there's, there's some commonality in just the overall vibe, I would say in terms of just, you know, uh, West Wing's done with a very idealistic look at how government and politics could be done. And in some ways I feel like that's the emotion that you ultimately feel behind Hamilton as well, even though it's messy. Um, I don't know that it's, there's, I think there's some commonality there. Um, yeah. Did you did you hear the rumor about the the way that the the King's music was written was made to mimic the Beatles? No. Huh. What's Yeah, so so the the idea between, you know, and all of his songs have the same melody. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. And and it's it's meant to sound like a Beatles ballad because it's a British invasion. Mm. Hey. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> That's great. And then the last part I, I, I liked is, uh, I was, I was going to mention is just that piece at the end when they're writing, leading up to the duel, when Burr and Hamilton are writing their letters back and forth and they're singing that song <laughs> that ends with, I have the honor to be your obedient servant. Yeah. A dot Burr, a dot ham. Yeah. <laughs> back and forth yeah. and back. This is all fun and games. It's so I'm your polite. servant. Polite niceties. If you've got something to say, name a time and place, face to face. I have the honor to be your obedient servant. A dot Burr. Mr. Vice President, I am not the reason no one trusts you. No one knows what you believe. I will not equivocate on my opinion. I have always worn it on my sleeve. Even if I said what you think I said, you would need to cite a more specific grievance. Here's an itemized list of 30 years of disagreements. Sweet Jesus. I have the honor to be your obedient servant. A dot ham. Yeah. Um... And, I went uh, and found on the internet a couple of the letters between them yeah. back and forth, and they really did sign off that way. That's how they signed oh, off. That's no, so that, those were, that was real. Like that, that was, yeah, that was just quoting from the letters. <laughs> well, and I love that a lot of this is like little quotes. I mean, even the, uh, so I printed out the Reynolds pamphlet because I'm like, how, how long is it? It's 12 pages of him like oh, well, yeah. defending himself. <laughs> Yeah, and literally apologize ish apologizes ish in one paragraph of the twelve pages, and the rest of the time he's like, "It's it's amazing to me the writing." I mean, I had to Google half of the words. I'm like, "What does this mean? What does this mean?" I don't even know. But he's literally like. He starts out just like harping on people, like you know, if you're a true patriot, you you wouldn't be lying about people and did it. So he's like setting all these people up, like they're you know these people would frame the character, you know, and goes through and he's like, you know, 
I have never done anything, you know, I have this unblemished monetary character <laughs> when it comes to money, like talking about when it comes to money, because, you know, they're accusing him of misusing funds or whatever. And then basically boils down to this one paragraph where he's like, it's basically because this guy extorted me and like goes on and on about the Maria Reynolds. And he's like, you know, I could have stopped you know, but she's very persuasive, you know, kind of. De- and I'm like, dude, and, and I'm reading this going. <laughs> Blame it on Eve. Well, he's literally he's literally like it's a 12 page mansplaining about why. <laughs> I'm like, what is happening here? Like the most elaborate, like, well, if, if she wouldn't have been so, you know, Gentleman persuasive, point. you know, this is she she ruined my life. <sighs> You know, and it just, and it's just so much finger pointing and it's not his fault. And everyone was just extorting him at just, and to see that some of the lines in the pamphlet I'm reading through and there are like literal lines that he uses, um, that are in the musical and how much Lin-Manuel Miranda had to have read and researched and looked behind and to be able to pull like, oh, I'm going to pull this exact quote from one of his actual writings and these actual letters and put them in so that when people see this, I mean, some of it is entertainment, but there's so much of it that is actual history. Mm -hmm. And for people to really enjoy history, but then also with all the layers, walking away going, I need to just soak up the meaning behind this and to dig a little deeper and to see what, you know, and the hints at, oh, it's just, it was fascinating. So fascinating. But I love that he pulls like the actual words from some of these letters uh, and puts it in the score of the songs. It's really incredible. Yeah. On the same note, the, the letter to John Adams was cut out of the performance for time. And instead, uh, he just goes, sit down, John, you fat. And then he (laughs) drops this big stack of papers. So I go and I I try to find that letter. And it is a it is a novel. It is a dictionary (laughs) of what he had to say to and about John Adams. And they on the mixtape, they put the song back in and it's performed by Watsky, who raps at 100 miles an hour. And it's it's on point, just like you said, he's digging things out of the actual letters and putting it into the verses. And you can I I can see how in order to to basically say, okay, look, we don't have time for this. We're just going to drop drop a stack of papers right? (laughs) (laughs) and that's going to convey the message. It, It was phenomenal. Oh, man, man. Um, the last thing that I had that I was going to mention, um, was just to the, it, it was interesting to watch the development of the political parties, um, which really sort of kicks off here, but, um, to watch how Southern mother flicking democratic Republicans, democratic Republicans. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I've so, never heard that. Yeah. Um, how, <laughs> you know, Washington wanted nothing to do with political parties in fact, most of or a lot of his farewell address is tied to the danger of political parties. Um, and then you kind of have the Hamilton Adams Federalist Party um, developed early on. And then the Democratic Republican Party that is the Jefferson Madisonian uh, Party. Um, and that basically takes you uh, up until uh, 1824, 1828. And then the Whig Party comes along as that Jefferson Madison party splits, the Federalist party kind of craters Mm -hmm. under the weight of uh, things around the war of 1812 and their lack of involvement there. So that then the other party splinters, that's kind of where you get the the two parties that we've kind of more come to know now. Um, The Whigs uh, at the time took over that group. And then the Democrats, the Whig party falls out as the Republicans gain ground becoming the anti-slavery party, but basically otherwise are similar in policy to the Whigs. So the neck that elevates with Lincoln and in the civil war. Mm. And then basically we've had the same essential structure of the parties since then, although there have been shifts obviously in what constituents um, make up and, and kind of the, some of the issues that are important to each and all that obviously have changed over time. Um, but, um, 
It's interesting, though, how the, the actual parties themselves we've had since essentially the end of the Civil War with the Republicans and Democrats. Um, but at the first 60 to 80 years, we had quite a bit of transition mm-hmm. between the actual parties. Um, and uh, so, yeah, interesting to see how that has developed over time. I know. And how it's kind of stayed that two party system, but then the parties themselves have kind of shifted in their yeah. own respects. Yeah. So, and is that really working anymore? <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother podcast. Washington's warning and that's farewell a, address. It doesn't podcast. sound like it's uh, that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and interestingly enough, I mean, the, the shifting, it seems like it always revolves around slavery. Hmm. So, well, I mean, you, you, or you issues, have, or at least the civil rights movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was around the around the civil rights uh, era is is when the shift happened again, right? And and you even get it in religion because then you get the 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 Baptist the Southern Baptist Convention and. Um, Southern Baptist and the, and the, and the, the first Baptist. And that was n- not a geographical issue. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we weren't fighting about <laughs> the, the Southern there did not uh, indicate conversation about yeah. where we were going to put the headquarters. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, uh, closing thoughts. Who's got some closing mm. thoughts? We've talked about a lot. We've barely scratched and the surface. Yeah, and it does feel that way. So like much and not this. enough. Here's one thing. Here's one closing thought. I don't know about you, Robert. I want to see it live. Yeah. For sure. Uh, I can't wait to the chance to, uh, to see it in person. Um, and uh, I know that if I watch it even on the stream, like – two, three more times, there's going to be new things. There, there'll be new things that I pick up and catch and, and all of that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's one thing for sure. You know, I, I, I want to jump on some ideas that you've talked about in the past and that I saw that were on your outline. So like the question being, how does this movie hold up? Mm-hmm. And I think that, I, I think that this is going to be timeless. I think that it's first of all because it's talking about history and right. just the the thing that we need to to maintain and keep track of and and the idea that if you don't if you don't know your history then you're doomed to repeat it. Mm-hmm. But there's so many relevant themes to today which I don't think are ever not going to be relevant. Right. Um just this idea of being wise, like taking, taking the most out of life, shooting your shot, um, being wise, waiting for the opportune moment, waiting for it. Um, the idea that, um, there's, um, there, there's this, this conversation about, you know, whether or not we we have to be divided and the the things that we're choosing to fight over um and just realizing that you know ideally this 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 government and and our people are supposed to be working together um uh, history having its eyes on the decision makers um, our leaders and, and even our citizens and the things that we're doing. I mean, it's just like you said, Daniel, like from 2016 to 2020, I mean, all those different ideas. I, I've seen pictures from protest rallies where people are holding up signs that say something uh, from Hamilton on it. So like one of them that was uh, the most poignant was a woman holding a sign at a rally that said history has its eyes on you. Mm. I mean, that. Yeah that just it says something different in 2020. I think it's always going to say something new and something relevant. Um, and so I, I, I think that this is going to hold up forever and ooh, can't wait to talk about gavels. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that and rankings, um, I did pull, I didn't mention it earlier, but um, 
you know, IMDb we've used, uh, it's got a, it's got a top, uh, rated, uh, legal movie list, um, in it. And we've obviously used that as well as a bunch of other lists to kind of come up with our pool of movies to potentially talk about. Um, and, uh, it actually has, um, if you were to throw Hamilton into that list, uh, it would be, uh, let's see, where is it here? Oh, it's maybe page two. Um, <laughs> it would be the number two legal movie in all of IMDb in terms of its rating. It's got an 8.8, 8, um, mm. and, uh, 12 angry men, which we haven't done yet. Um, uh, which is a, it is obviously a, a well regarded movie as well is an 8.9, .9, but that's it. Um, so you throw Hamilton on the IMDb best legal movies list and it's number two, um, on just IMDb rating. Um, and it was, a you know, it's a critical success in every way. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, the gavels, uh, do you have our, uh, scores in front of you? Pull it up here. Gavel standings. <laughs> so a few good men. I gave a 98. You gave a 95. We ended up with a blended score of 96.5. Right. My cousin Vinny, I went 99 and then you did 85, <laughs> but there was an appeal. Yes. And you came back. I did. And realized that the lower court was wrong. Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> the trial court judge was out to lunch that day and, uh, and screwed that one up. So he had to be reversed on appeal. Yeah. And uh, went so, up to a 91. Yes. For an average of 94. Witness for the prosecution, I scored it at a 90. You scored it at an 88 with a combined score of 89. Liar, liar, 88 for me, 84 for you, 86 combined score. The Lincoln lawyer, 85 for me, 83 for you, 84 combined score. Marshall, 80 for me, 82 for you, 81 combined. And then Legally Blonde, 89 for me, 87 for you, landing at 88. So, drum roll, please. Drum roll, please. Uh, wait for it, wait you, for you, Adrian, you want an unofficial vote wait on the gavels? It, wait for it. <laughs> no, because well, it's hard because if you're ranking it against ones you've already seen, or are you giving it on a blind? I mean, it's a, it's not blind. Blind it's sort of, I mean, I think of it as I'm slotting it in <laughs> somewhere. Um, and so here's, here's where I kind of came down on this. Okay. Um, I'm going to, with an asterisk, <laughs> uh, uh, with an asterisk, I'm going to uh, give this a 95 as well as A Few Good Men. Wow. And here's my asterisk. The only reason that I'm not giving it higher than 95 is because it's, at least in my mind, two months old. A Few Good Men has withstood... 25 years. We watched it back and did the podcast um, this year, and, and it's literally 25 years old. And so there's an element to how well a movie holds up. You talked about it earlier that you think Hamilton will. I agree with you. My anticipation is that uh, this movie would ultimately be a higher score than it would be the number one on my list of all of these and, and be, and would surpass a few good men, but I don't think it's fair to do that to it yet. Um, so soon out of the gate. Um, cause I want to give a little bit of legacy time for that. Um, but <laughs> nevertheless, I'm going to stick there and, and, and still put it right at the 95 that I gave a few good men, which is the highest score I've given. I know you're really short changing. you you're hurt. <laughs> I like all his scores are like lowballing people. Wait to see what you get jury duty. <laughs> are you guys, are you She's been do wanting to do jury duty for like. I want to hop in on that one. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's. let's Robert, what you got? One hundred. Like, what are you <laughs> even doing? Why are I you even asking? He didn't give himself any room to do anything but. 100. I was waiting for like a hundred and two or something like over a hundred. That's what yeah, I was no. like. Yeah, he, he was capped like, out. How, he had to do a hundred. How, how He'd already done ninety nine. Be a hundred. Yeah. Oh, right. my cousin Vinny, and I have no regrets. I just I've never <laughs> seen Twelve Angry Men. <laughs> no regrets. But I I just don't think it's gonna beat my cousin Vinny, but I mean, there's what's going to be Hamilton. I mean, Oh my goodness. These themes that we're going to be talking about for ever and ever and ever. Um, and just the, the 
brilliance of it. I mean, part of it is is what we're talking about, the message, but then part of it is the delivery. I mean, to sure. to have a musical where rap is so much an important part of it. And then even the styles of music, like you've got yeah. um, in, uh, oh goodness, the yeah, and Wait For It, there's like this Caribbean, like the, mm-hmm. the percussion of the, the claps, like the, um, the, the, it almost sounds like steel drum. I know it's not steel drum, but just the main melody, um, yeah. the, it just, it feels Caribbean. And then like that picks up again, um, with the nonstop and then like the, 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 the turntable stage. I mean, that's almost a character all to itself. Right. Yeah. And and just all the the different levels and details about how like Burr always walks in a straight line, Hamilton always moves in an arc, the bullet, um, the dual casting. You know, Lafayette is is Jefferson. I mean, just there. I can't see anything beating this. Hey, you, it's, uh, it's a- there is uh, nothing unreasonable at all about what you just said. So. Uh, it's a great movie. It's a great show. Can't wait to see it live. I'll watch it again a number of times. We'll listen to it on the rig forever, probably. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Robert, thank you again for doing this. And, uh, I'm excited to, uh, have the chance to sit down with you again. And, uh, Adrian, thanks for joining us as well. Again, this is back to back, actually season uh-huh. finale of last year, season premiere of this year. Adrian, watch out. Knocking it out. Back. <laughs> <laughs> Starting a trend. That's Hey-o. right. Hopefully got some uh, good movies to review or to not review, to dive into uh, coming up uh, as well. So stick with us for that. Um, but thanks everyone for listening and uh, let us know if, what we got wrong. Let us know what we got right. I'm stepping down, I'm not <laughs> thanks everybody. All right, let's teach them how to say goodbye. Sorry, what? One last time. Relax, have a drink with me one last time Let's take a break tonight And then we'll teach them how to say goodbye Just say goodbye 